The Florida Everglades, a complex system of waterways located in the southern tip of the United States. The two million acre ecosystem originates at the beginning of the Kissimmee River and flows south to the shallow waters of Lake Okeechobee. Historically, during the wet season, the lake overflowed its banks, forming a slow-moving river passing through a series of diverse habitats that make up the Everglades. Since the 1800s, the Everglades have been a victim of human development. To settle the Everglades, water diversion tactics were used to drain the wetlands for agricultural and urban settlement. By taking water away, the Everglades have decreased by more than half their original size. These wetlands provide many benefits that people take for granted. The waters of the Everglades are essential for agriculture services and help in reducing the impact of natural disasters such as flooding and hurricanes. Humans have caused great damage to the Everglades over the past 200 years. More recently, the introduction of invasive species is destroying this delicate ecosystem at an increasing rate. An invasive species is considered invasive when it's not only non-native, but also it um, does damage to the ecology either by destroying the ecology or um, altering the ecosystem. So not all exotic animals and plants are considered invasive, but um, there are definitely several invasive species in the Everglades that are causing major concerns. The introduction of these non-native species into the Everglades throws off the balance of nature. When flora and fauna do not balance, it proves to be detrimental to the habitat and to many of the native species. It has been people who have introduced these foreign invaders, which have caused harm to the ecosystem by exploiting native plants and animals. Many of the newly introduced invasive species tend to thrive in the Everglades. The subtropical environment makes for a suitable habitat. The lack of natural predators makes survival easy. Once these species establish a population, termination is likely impossible. South Florida is home to one of the largest pet trades in the United States. Many people obtain exotic pets but are incapable of handling them or are not prepared for the challenge when the animal reaches its full size. I think our biggest concern at the, at the moment, and for a couple of different reasons, um, has to be the, uh, the, the exotic non-native reptiles that we have. And the most notable one right now is the Burmese python. Um, the Burmese python has come to us because of intentional, possibly unintentional releases um, over time from animals that people no longer wanted as pets because they start out small, they get really big, uh, they take a lot of room, they take a lot of time and money and effort to care for and to clean up after. And no one wants to, uh, to accept or adopt a, um, a large animal once, uh, once it does get big. So we now have a breeding population of Burmese python throughout the Everglades, and we're quite concerned about what they're eating and what they're, who they're competing with um, for food as well. The Burmese pythons have been, at least since the 1990s, been in the Everglades since the mid-1990s, maybe even before that, and now what we're seeing is a reduction in the mid-sized mammals along the main park road. Both visitors and researchers alike are commenting on the absence of marsh rabbits, on the absence of possums and raccoons. Um, there's reason to believe that it's more than just coincidence that the uptick, the uprise of Burmese pythons and the disappearance of these meso mammals, these mid-sized mammals, might be related. And there might actually be some causation going on where Burmese pythons are eating enough such that they're, they're, uh, they're affecting the population structure and the population size of marsh rabbits, possums, and, and raccoons. The Burmese is a, is a trophic, what we call a trophic generalist. It eats across a, a wide range of taxa, bird, mammal, and even reptiles. It's everything from uh, the small native cotton rats and cotton mice all the way up through um, possums and raccoons and marsh rabbits and bobcats. Uh, we've even found deer. But we also have evidence that that Burmese pythons may actually actively forage into a nesting area, like into a nest of a rodent or maybe into a nest of a bird. Um, we have seen uh, uh, Burmese pythons that have uh, had what we call 
were, were what we called hyperphagic, where they, they literally ate as much as they could possibly stuff into themselves from, from the very tip to the very end. In one case, we had 14 individual cotton rats inside of about a seven foot Burmese python, and there literally was no more room. And what we saw was all kinds of different age classes, and it was told us that that Burmese python actively went into a nest and ate everything that was, was there or around. Eating patterns are a good way to judge the invasiveness of a species within an ecosystem. By analyzing what these animals are eating, it helps scientists to better understand their impacts on the area around them. Researchers at the Florida Atlantic University conduct stomach content analyses on invasive species to record what different animals have been consuming. Stomach, what is a stomach content analysis? Really, it's a relatively crude look at the identity of the material within the stomach. We also measure the volume of it to get some idea of how much the animal has been eating, but primarily what we're interested in is figuring out what has the animal been eating. It's really relevant to trying to figure out what impact the animals will have here in South Florida. There has been some real concern of whether they could threaten nesting birds, so what, how, do we find birds' eggs in their stomachs, for example. There's some real concern that if they get to Key Largo, will they threaten some of the endemic rodents that live there? When we start out, the first thing to do is to get some gross morphological measurements. So we weigh the animals and measure them from what we call snout to vent length, which is a standardized measure that takes into account for the, the fact that their tail may have, been, may have broken off or something. It's a very good measure for, the, for their body length. And then we start opening them up. Before we do that, though, there are a couple of other external uh, things that we can look at that will tell us that this is the species that we know has already been established in South Florida. We look to see at the couple of scales that are in front of the eye, and the scales that are behind the eye should be smaller than the scales that are on the, on the dorsum of the animal. So once we've looked at those things and established that it is indeed the, um, the Argentine tegu, then we we open the animal up and basically we, we, we cut the skin from the vent of the animal up to its throat and then we start opening up the body cavity. What we can get from the body cavity I think are three really important pieces of information. From the amount of fat that it's managed to store we can judge whether the animals are are behaving appropriately physiologically for our South Florida environment and whether they're able to eat enough to, to store energy that will, will enable them to survive the winter. And then we can look at their gonads and try and determine whether they are capable of reproducing and whether they're actually in reproductive condition at the time that, we, that we've cut them open. From the contents of the gut, we can determine what the animal has eaten and perhaps some idea of the volume that it's eaten. There has been some real concern of whether they could threaten nesting birds. So what, how, do we find birds' eggs in their stomachs, for example? There's some real concern that if they get to Key Largo, will they threaten some of the endemic rodents that live there? Uh, so it's, it's, it's particularly relevant today that we found those, those baby rats in the stomach of this uh, tegu. So what is a tegu and why do we have them here and, and uh, what, what, what might, might we expect of them? The tegu is the largest of the lizards from South America. It's, all, it's the ecological equivalent of the monitor lizards that live in, in Africa, for example. They're predatory lizards. They they're mostly live on the ground. Um, they grow to be about three or four feet long. The particular one we have here is called the Argentine or black and white tegu. Um, there have been occasional captures of the red tegu but those seem to be released pets. They have not actually established themselves as a population in Florida. One example of how analyzing an animal's diet reveals the extent of its impact is the Cuban tree frog. The Cuban tree frog is native to the Caribbean and is now the largest tree frog in the United States. These predators were believed to have been brought in by accident through the ornamental plant trade. As plants are shipped from the Caribbean to South Florida, the frog receives a free ride. Cuban tree frogs uh, continuously do come into the United States still through the tr plant trade, and they're continuously distributed around the U.S. that way. People are finding them all around the entire United States because not only do they live in Miami, they're living inside all the plants in Miami, 
And as those palm trees and various other ornamental plants get shipped around the United States, they'll continuously be distributed around various states. So they do continue to pop up that way. And that's one of the main reasons why Cuban tree frogs are very difficult to remove because they do continuously come back and they are in such high numbers. Cuban tree frogs impact our native environment through feeding on our native frogs and toads, as well as displacing them. Uh, Cuban tree frogs can get to be over five inches long, which makes them the largest tree frog we have in the state of Florida. So not only will they eat our frogs and toads, they will displace them out of their habitats, but they'll also take their food resources. Um, in addition to that, a lot of people dislike having Cuban tree frogs in and around their yards and their houses because of the mess they leave through the waste that they produce. These tree frogs are also believed to have been released from pet owners because of the toxic secretion that is discharged from their skin. This same discharge makes them unpalatable to birds and other predators, thus eliminating natural constraints on their population growth. They are a voracious predator that may have a large impact on native frogs in the Everglades. Another animal has found its way into the Everglades and is here to stay. The purple swamp hen, a native to Asia, is now spreading through the Everglades at an increasing rate. Its natural habitat consists of marshes and wetlands, which makes the Everglades a favorable environment. This bird is named for its colorful plumage and its resemblance to a chicken. Despite having long legs and unwebbed feet, the purple swamp hen swims very well in water. Purple swamp hens are in Florida as a result of released pets. Uh, we think this population started with about eight individuals and is now in excess of a thousand. We attempted to eradicate them but were unsuccessful. So it seems that purple swamp hens are here to stay in Florida. They um, are an omnivore, although they are primary, primarily a vegetarian. We have found that they do eat snails, native snails in Florida. Purple swamp pens are a carrier bird flu, although they have not been found to have any in Florida. Um, they will destroy a marsh in terms of its vegetation by ripping it out. They also, in other countries, are known to predate on small chicks of other birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish and things like that. So they are, uh, the reason they're here is because of an unregulated pet trade that allowed them to be purchased and then an irresponsible person let them go. They will harass native bird species like stilts. Um, so basically harassment of other animals, they eat snails and they destroy plants. It's what we know they do here in Florida. These birds are a bird that in their native range, they come from a freshwater marsh areas, areas that are marshy, they do enjoy marshes. So they just really know how to avoid predators. And one of the ways they do adapt is that they can go under the water and hold onto the vegetation underwater until danger passes above. They'll fly and they can fly great distances or they hide under water or they just run. And it's amazing how a big purple bird can actually be very hidden in a green and brown marsh, but they just have a way of eluding you, and they're very good at that. And they know what vegetation provides them the best type of cover, and the spike brush really does that. Several programs have been implemented to control the spread of the purple swamp hen. So far, none of them has been effective because these birds breed extremely fast and are difficult to locate despite their vibrant color. A species over which Florida is finally starting to gain control is the Melaleuca tree. This tree originates from Australia and is known for its ability to absorb large amounts of water. Agricultural development required more land in South Florida, and without drying up areas of the Everglades, there would be no land to farm. However, people did not foresee the impact these trees would have on this delicate ecosystem. Malacu is an invasive species that we have here at the refuge. It's one of our top four species. It's a tree that was brought here in the um, late 1920s, early 1930s as a pulpwood uh, to develop an industry down here in South Florida. And they found out that it absorbed a lot of water and some bright folks decided to get rid of this 
beautiful wetlands behind us and turn it into houses and agricultural land. And so the aerial seeded in Maluka into the refuge and across the entire Everglades system. And in doing that, uh, we have um, just literally thousands of acres of an invasive species tree that is sucking up water, uh, displacing uh, other native trees and other na native plants. It's also interfering with the roosting and the nesting habitats of a lot of our wading birds because they use those trees and they're easy for predators to get to their nests from. It's uh, very similar to the eucalyptus tree. Uh, it has the oils and the smell, and it's uh, actually a very nice landscape tree. And it's quite often still used today as a landscape tree throughout South Florida, which is also an issue because everywhere they plant it, uh, each one of those trees can literally produce uh, three times a year millions of seeds. There's a seed pod on it, it has little individual chambers, and in each one of those chambers are seeds the size of um, a black pepper. In every place it lands, it takes less than a couple of months for a new tree to sprout. They estimate that uh, one single tree of Maluka will absorb up to 100 gallons of water per day per tree and we have about 97 or had about 97,000 acres of Maluka at the refuge and that's literally millions of trees and they were all absorbing that much water per day. Uh, with our program here at the refuge we've been really targeting that specific tree and we have reduced that acreage down to less than 14,000. The, the refuge uh, spends anywhere from two to five million dollars a year and most of that is in contract work. So we contract uh, local businesses that are in the uh, exotic plant removal business to come here to the refuge. We give them an assigned area, we give them an assigned species and then they target controlling that. Florida has taken great strides in preventing the introduction of future invasive species. New regulations have been implemented on the exotic pet trade and other government programs are being put into action. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission holds a Pet Amnesty Day annually for pet owners, during which illegal and legal exotic pets alike can be turned over to the government without any legal consequences. This program encourages people to place their exotic pets in the right hands. Pet Amnesty Day is an event that we do that allows people who can no longer keep their exotic pets to turn them into us. It's free of charge, we don't give any penalties for unlicensed animals, and it's a way to keep those animals from being released into natural habitats. It gets those animals into the hands of licensed or experienced caregivers. And we did our first event in 2006, and we've had quite a bit of success. We've had several events over those six years, and in that time, we've had over 400 animals surrendered to us and then adopted back out to caregivers. I also get a lot of calls in between events, so I've also placed many animals in between Amnesty Day events. Some of the folks that we have at our event here in Miami are going to be Miami-Dade Fire Rescue. We have the Reef Environmental Education Foundation coming in to talk about some of the different marine issues, especially things like lionfish today. The mission of Pet Amnesty Day really is to promote responsible pet ownership. That's what we're all about here. And Pet Amnesty Day is not only an event where people can surrender their pets that they can no longer care for, but it's also an event for the general public. We have exhibits at most of our events. We have experts here. People can come in and talk to these people and learn how to be a responsible pet owner. People that are thinking about getting an exotic pet or people that might already own an exotic pet and want to ask some questions about it. We would like people to be knowledgeable before they buy their pets and bring them home. Pet Amnesty Day is a, is a wonderful way for us to allow people that are in possession of animals that perhaps they don't want anymore uh, or they're just, they've, they've outgrown them and it allows them to come over here and relinquish these animals with no questions asked. The law enforcement side of it is that, you know, we have certain rules, regulations and laws that people need to abide by before they think about possessing one of these animals. Uh, we're here to educate the public, to uh, tell them what they can and cannot do. There are certain permitting requirements that you need to abide by. 
There are certain caging requirements that you need to abide by. And if you do all those things right, you'll never have a problem with our agency. But what we've noticed is that individuals, unfortunately, receive some of these pets uh, as gifts, or they find the pets, or they find these animals uh, in, in, in areas uh, in, the, in the wild, or whatever the case may be, in the Everglades. And when they're very young, and they keep them for a while, and then afterwards, now they're too big, they can't care for them anymore, and then they release them. And they release them out in the ecosystem of South Florida where they don't belong. And that has caused a problem for us with invasive species, and that's why we're do, we do this. We want people to just turn in the animals, no questions asked, and uh, we'll go from there. The Everglades are under invasion. To restore this delicate ecosystem, it will take great cooperation from people, government agencies, and countries around the world. In 2000, a plan to restore the Everglades was signed by Congress. To this day, it remains the most expensive and complex restoration plan in history. With threatened and endangered species residing within the Everglades, it is important that the Everglades remain under a rigorous program of conservation. Around the world, habitats just like the Everglades are facing the same problems. But by taking preemptive measures and with diligent care, we can ensure the future of all of these natural habitats, including the Florida Everglades.